my Juicy co-creators, Lilu here. I'm in beautiful, magnificent Paris in the first district with Kathleen today. Hello, Kathleen. Hello, Lilu. I'm so excited to meet you. Hello, New York cool. Times bestseller, one million copies of your books worldwide in so many different languages. The Expected One, the um, the Miracle, what's the latest one? The, the non Expected One, The Book of Love and The Poet Prince are the three pieces of fiction. And The Source of Miracles is the nonfiction book. So you, and you just came back from a Mary Magdalene tour, and this is what really this video is all about. Oh, and tell us where we're standing and why we chose to do this video here, particularly in this location. Well, we chose to do this video in this location because this church was the Paris church, the parish church of the kings and queens of France, when the Louvre, which is right across the street from us, was the palace. So. What happened was the queens of France were very, very involved with this church. And as a result, this church is loaded with feminine energy and symbolism. So these women were very, very involved with the idea of bringing back the divine feminine and protecting the ideas of the divine feminine hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So the queens of France were way ahead of their time in terms of what they were trying to do. And one of the women, of course, that they were most devoted to was Mary Magdalene. So she appears very often in this church and is very important within this church. So tell us about her whole story and what type of agreement, from my understanding, it was an agreement that was made beforehand that well, she was going to come here and... Yeah, I think one of the things that... When I first started studying her in 1995, I came to France and I had no idea that I was going to find this amazing, rich treasure trove of story yeah. uh, about her. Because in America, you don't really hear this much. In fact, even biblical scholars in America today will say, oh, there's no proof that Mary Magdalene was ever in France. Well, there's no proof that Mary Magdalene was never in France if you have never been to France. But if you've been to France, she is everywhere. She is, she is in churches, she's in the architecture, she's, there are statues and grottos. And this idea of her being here is not a, it's not a theory, it's not mythology, it's fact, it's history here. Mary Magdalene arrived in France after the crucifixion and she really became the first Christian missionary. For the people in the southwest of France, in many ways, Mary Magdalene is the first pope. She really creates Christianity. But what happens is she starts a form of Christianity that is never affected by politics, economics, all of those things. She teaches the way of love. That's what she teaches. And that is the essence of the tradition that grows here throughout France uh, and still exists for 2,000 years, but it had to be very carefully protected because it was heresy for many, many hundreds of years, and it was the reason for crusades and death for hundreds of thousands of people. So was it actually uh, repressed, or uh, because we talk now these days a lot about the sacred feminine, and so that's why I'm interested to talk about Mary Magdalene, but it feels like for many, many years and decades the, 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 the feminine energy was put down. Tell us about uh, what happened then at these times with her and, and, and then how we got to the point that we're here right now on Earth. Well, it was, it was brutally repressed, but if you look at the early church, not just in France, but throughout Europe, even particularly in Rome, you look at the, the first few centuries of Christianity, and there are all these incredible examples of women who were changing the world and were leading this religious and spiritual conversion to this way of love. Um, so it's really not until Constantine in the fourth century, all these things start to happen when the church really begins to change, and all of a sudden, women become less and less important and are ultimately written out of the story. Uh, and Mary Magdalene is ultimately written out of the story. But it never becomes more important and more tragic than what happens here in France in the, in the Middle Ages. And here we have in the 12th century and 13th century, we have a full-blown crusade against the followers and descendants of Mary Magdalene in the southwest of France. And these people were known as the Cathars. Uh, so when you talk about the Cathar Crusades or the Albigensian Crusades, this was when the Pope declared war against these people for basically practicing this beautiful form of Christianity, which was about faith uh, and love and community and healing. Um, you know, they used the Lord's Prayer as a daily practice. Uh, and, and this is all that they did. But because they were growing in strength and growing in popularity, because it was it was a Gnostic tradition. The Cathars taught that you have a relationship with God all by yourself. Uh, you don't have to have anyone in between. It became very, very dangerous to the church. But the other thing that was really dangerous was that the Cathars had uh, a huge female leadership base. Uh, everyone in the Cathar tradition was was spiritually equal, whether male or female. And there were a lot of female spiritual leaders. And this was another thing that became very, very dangerous. So the church decided they had to eradicate this heresy and it, they basically committed genocide. They killed hundreds of thousands of people uh, to 
eliminate this idea. And then they would have these, they would do these terrible massacres, the massacre of Bézier in uh, 1209, uh, the mass burnings of Cathars in, in Minerva in 1210. It all happens on July 22nd. And that is because this is the feast day of Mary Magdalene. And they wanted to punish these people for claiming to be descended from her, not just from a bloodline point of view, but from a spiritual point of view. They wanted to punish them for being descended from this woman, this powerful woman, and carrying on these traditions. So what is it today all about then, related to Mary Magdalene? How can we learn from that? And, and, and is there some still some uh, sacred places like where you were, where we can just fill ourselves up with this Mary Magdalene energy? Or is it about finding ourselves the Mary Magdalene in us? What is it? What, what can we learn? How can we put this? Because I'm all about putting this in practice in our life and, and really participating actively, you know, in however way we can. Well, I think it's all of it's all of the above. It's all of those things. Uh, and it's about getting back to this really basic idea, uh, you know, what Jesus says in Matthew 22, which is love God, love each other, love yourself. That's it. If you have those things, then, you know, this is, this is what you need to have to live. But one of the reasons we do these tours to France, and we call it Sacred France, uh, is because what we have seen, what I have certainly seen over the last almost 20 years of doing this and bringing people here, is the stories are so alive down there still. Uh, and, the, and the teachings are so alive down there. There are communities of people who live in this beautiful, amazing way that is only about love and faith and community and healing. And so when you go there and you visit this and you see it in action, it, do, it physically changes you. It changes you to the cellular core of your being. So I, anyone who is really fascinated or interested in the Mary Magdalene story, if they can come to the southwest of France and see it in action, it will change you forever. Yeah. If you can't make it, then I, I, would, I would recommend, you know, studying what her, her real teachings were, um, reading some of the Gnostic Gospels. The Gnostic Gospel of Philip actually tells us a lot about Mary Magdalene, uh, tells us a lot about the idea of sacred union, this idea of sacred marriage and traditions that were coming through what we called the way of love. And that's what my book, The Book of Love, is about. It's about what these traditions were really about, how they were really lived throughout Europe. But they still exist today, and that's the exciting part. And it's accessible to all of us. And it is just an amazing, pure spiritual tradition that is all about love and community. So would you say that all of us are carrying in our gene potentially or something part of that Mary Magdalene complex or, or energy that we need to let go of? Is that something that is possible? Um, I don't necessarily know that we think we need to let go of it. I think the idea is that... Or embrace it. Embrace, <laughs> I like that idea much more. You know, look, here is a woman who came to France as a refugee. She was hunted by the Romans. She had just gone through the most uh, traumatic events possible. Um, she comes here without knowing the language, without knowing anything about the people or the culture, um, with what clothes she has on her back and a couple of her friends and tiny children. And yet she establishes the first schools, missions, even the first homeless shelter is, are credited to her here in France. So this is a woman of extraordinary character and courage and strength to overcome obstacles. I think Mary Magdalene speaks to a lot of modern women right now. A lot of women are really embracing this inner Magdalene because she is able to overcome obstacles. She has grace under pressure in, you know, in the embodiment of um, what it's like to be able to overcome obstacles. So she, for us, becomes this great model uh, of being able to stay in that place of love, stay in that place of community, stay in that place of service while overcoming all of our own personal stuff. It's a really graceful way to live. How about on the centrality, sexuality side? That's what also I wanted to talk about because there is a little bit of that complex for women. Oh, absolutely. And, and this is a piece of it too because, you know, what happens is we, we went through such a long time in, in Christianity with the whore Madonna complex. You know, the only way you could be a Madonna was if you were a virgin. But when you start breaking down the early Gnostic traditions, what you find is it's a very, very sensual tradition. And this is some of the stuff that was written out of the canonical Gospels. But this is why I say if you go back to the Gnostic Gospels, if you look at the Gospel, the Gospel of Philip is really sensual. And this is the Gospel that talks about how important it is to share the Nashak, the same sacred breath, right? That's the kiss, the kiss where you exchange your life force with another being. Um, and it's about being fully conscious in terms of your sensuality. It talks about this idea of hieros gamos, sacred marriage. And in order for that to happen, there must be trust and consciousness in the bedroom. So it is this incredibly powerful, beautiful, amazing tradition um, of literally seeing God uh, when you are in a sensual union with your partner. This is where the idea of seeing God comes from, that when you are in union with your partner, 
partner, you are bringing together this balance of masculine and feminine energy, which is divine. And in it, you see God. You see God in your partners, you see God in yourself, and you have this extraordinary experience. That's what the Hieros Gamos tradition is all about. So that's another thing that I think Mary Magdalene encourages us to do, is to step into our sensuality in a way that is really deeply spiritual and utterly transformational. Tell us about her relationship to Jesus. Well, I firmly believe that she was his partner, his wife, uh, legally. Um, but you know, it, it, a lot of there's a lot of attention to that, to the sensationalized idea that oh, Jesus is Mary Magdalene's wife and children and bloodline. All of that matters, and all of it's important. But for me, what really matters is she was his successor. He passed these traditions to her. He says to her, "When I am gone." You must take these traditions to the world. You are the only one who knows everything that I knew. And so she becomes his successor spiritually. And I think that's what really matters, is that she comes here to carry on his traditions, these traditions of the way, of love. Um, and she is the apostle of the apostles. It's not that the other ones don't matter. It's that she is special because she really is the leader of this tradition. And we see this over and over in the Gnostic Gospels, but we also see it in the art and the architecture in France. It shows us Mary Magdalene preaching to the people. It shows us her in a position of ultimate authority here. And that, I think, is very powerful. Wasn't she letting somehow Jesus be in front line and teaching also him? And then they had this teacher-student uh, relationship too between them? Well, you know, I think that there, there are a lot of different perspectives on what their relationship was like when they were together. I mean, I believe that she was a priestess in her own right. I don't believe that she came and, and sat at his feet all the time as an, as an apostle or as a disciple. I think they worked together, and I think that... Um, she brought to him as much as he brought to her. And again, that's the beauty of it, isn't it? We have this amazing balance. She brings her traditions. There's a lot of information about uh, the fact that she might have been trained in Egyptian traditions. Um, we have, you know, we look at ideas like the concept of resurrection, uh, which she is she is intimately involved in his resurrection, and her sister Martha is involved in the resurrection of, of Lazarus. So we see these women who are involved in these very powerful ancient mystery traditions. So certainly she brought her own power to this relationship. So I think what you have is you have two incredibly powerful spiritual teachers coming together to create this amazing tradition. It's very exciting. So how does it feel after traveling like you did on the on the tour and now being here? How what do you sense? Do you do you feel sometimes some activations and some new uh, thoughts, some new conclusions or some new Uh, things that you're taking with you through life now after all these experiences? Well, after almost about 17 years of doing this, what I'm seeing, especially in these last three years, uh, is how many more people are coming to these uh, these realizations and they're coming here to have them and they are having these activations and they are uh, going back into their own world and changing the world and taking these traditions with them. So what we're really seeing now is a resurgence of this way of love. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, Newsweek magazine in America uh, had a cover story that said, forget the church, follow Jesus. And the story was about how people are finding that the actual traditions and teachings of Jesus matter to them, but they're kind of done with the old patriarchal dogmatic ways of traditional religion. And Mary Magdalene, again, is really the poster girl for that. You know, she's really saying, you know, forget dogma, forget politics and economics, come into a way that is about love and community. There's a great community building, and that's what I'm the most excited about. And we see that as we travel here and we bring people on these groups to Sacred France, we see how in that one week where people are pulled out of their day-to-day -day lives and immersed in this spiritual tradition, that it utterly transforms them. Uh, and they're creating a really extraordinary community of people who are doing massive good works around the world. I would love to finish this interview with the power of the heart. What is truly there? What's happening here? I know it's a big question. It is a big question. Um, well, and I think that, you know, for me, a lot of this, the 2012 phenomenon is about this expansion of the heart. I think that we are moving out of 2,000 years of being in the head, of being in the mind, and moving into a time now where we really do have to uh, start practicing from the heart. Not only do we have to, but I think we're being moved to it. I think that there is a powerful energetic shift that is causing us yeah. to do that. And I think that is what's truly going to change the world. And that is what Mary Magdalene was about. She was about getting you into your heart space and, and teaching from that because that is the way of love. It comes from the heart and that's where we all need to be. Did you find yourself in front of some um, teachings especially to open the heart of hers that she was teaching back then? Did you, did you learn? 
Oh, absolutely. And I learned from her and I learned from Jesus both as well from, from these early t traditions. That's actually the, the last book that I wrote, the nonfiction book, The Source of Miracles, is about the Catholic prayer practice. It's about how they took this idea of the Lord's Prayer and that was their only real tradition. And But they didn't just say it as a prayer, they lived it every yeah. single day. And each one of those words mattered. It was about faith, it was about surrender. You know, there were all these important elements in it. And so it was understand truly understanding that practice and I had wonderful teachers here in France who taught me that, that piece that really utterly changed my life. And that's why it's called The Source of Miracles, because when you can come from a place of faith and trust and love, you can accomplish anything. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for this delicious conversation, Kathleen, in France. And now you're off to Toulouse. How yeah. fantastic. I just came back from there. <laughs> you're wonderful. Thank, thank you, Lilo. <laughs> much love, my beautiful co-creators from Paris and France. Bye.